probably 100% of our spiritual warfare and our dealing with devils and dealing with God is based upon communications. If the devil is going to corrupt you, it's going to be through and by communications. If the devil is going to corrupt a nation or a world, it's going to be by communication. I brought out to you uh, clearly that the Bible reveals to us that whenever Satan went into the Garden of Eden, he did not go in with force. He did not go in with power. So the devil is not going to kick your doors open. The devil is not going to come grab you by the throat. The devil is not going to come slice your throat. Somebody says, why can't the devil pull the trigger on you? Why can't the devil stab you? Why can't a demon spirit kill you? Simple, basic logic, brothers and sisters. If a demon spirit was able to kill anybody, they would have killed everybody. You simply wouldn't be here. If the devil could force his way into you, then there would be nobody living that was not filled with devils. There are means of resistance. If he could kill one Christian, he would have already killed every Christian that there is. The fact that he cannot kill a Christian means that he cannot harm you. So as I said in one of the earlier messages, what we have to understand is that when we talk about devils and demons, we're not talking about something for you to go home, be paranoid about, or be fearful about. They actually possess no power to harm you. They actually possess no power to possess you. It has to be done through communication. And we see that in the garden whenever the serpent slithered into the garden. And in going into the garden, he did not force his will upon Adam and Eve. He communicated with Adam and Eve. He entered in and began to talk. He began to ask questions. He's more subtle. He's slippery. He's sly. He's slick. He's smart. He's wise. He asked a question that was not a question at all. When you ask questions, you are seeking answers. But like a slithering, slippery lawyer who is trained for years, to ask you questions not for the purpose of getting an answer, but to ask you questions designed to trip you up. They already know the answers to the questions that they're asking. Satan already knew the answer to the question he asked. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? He knew what God said. He knew what the rule was. How did he even know to ask the question? What he did was he got woman, he got man, he got Adam and Eve to engage in conversation with him. Once he got them to engage in conversation with him, he then took everything they had. You find the devil's same identical approach in Matthew chapter 4. It's called the mountain of temptation. Remember after Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and the Bible said he hungered? And then the devil came to him in Matthew chapter 4, and the Bible said the devil tempted him. Four particular temptations. The very first one was he tempted Jesus to turn stones into bread. Now that alone tells you something about the nature of the devil. The devil had calculated. The devil had reasoned it out. What will be the best way to get him to fall? What would be my best approach right now with Jesus Christ? He measured in his head. He's been 40 days. He's not eight. He's hungry. So it's not by chance that the first temptation that the devil offered to Jesus was pertaining to bread. Now is it? The devil knows what you and I want. The devil knows what your nature is. And the devil knows what my nature is. So the devil will offer to you things that he knows is most likely to get you. Now your nature may be that you are weak in areas that I'm not. And that I'm weak in areas that you're not. So the means of which the devil will use to tempt you may very well be much different than the means of which he would use to tempt me. Some devils is going to tempt you with men. Another devil is going to tempt you with women. 
Some devils are going to tempt you with food. Other devils are going to tempt you with alcohol. Other devils are going to tempt you with dope. It's whatever your personality is. It's whatever your nature is. It's the thing that you like the most. It's the area that you're most likely to fail. It's the area that today, at this moment or this hour, that you are the weakest. Whenever Jesus had went 40 days without eating, he was hungry. So quite naturally, the best place to trip him up would be bread. So the devil's attack against you and the devil's attack against me is calculated. But it is not by force. He did not take bread on that hill and shove it down the throat of Jesus. You know why? Because he couldn't. He did not go into the garden and force man to eat of that tree. He didn't take the apple and force it in the woman's mouth. The devil is the same with Jesus. Then 4,000 years earlier, his approach was exactly the same. The results was different, but why were they different? Because when he slithered into the garden with the same approach he had with Jesus, Eve entertained conversation. She communicated with him. And everything was lost. The same devil, the same tactics, the same game was played 4,000 years later on the mountain of temptation with Jesus. He went in and tried to spark up conversation with Jesus. Jesus answered only, what? It is written. Adam and Eve never went to the word of God. And they was defeated. The Bible tells us that the sword of the spirit, the word of God, is the only offensive weapon that you have in the spiritual war. So if you don't have the spiritual weapon, what means do you have to defend yourself? None whatsoever. That's why Bible study, that's why Bible teaching, that's why Bible learning, that's why Bible reading for yourself is of the utmost importance. Because if this war is 100% based upon communication then we must know the difference in the voices that we hear talking to us if it's all built upon communication and it is 100 percent then we must understand that we cannot communicate with the devil and the means of which the devil is going to use to trip us up to lead us astray to harm us is going to be through some means of communication we're going to have to hear him talk. The Bible tells us this. In the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 17, it says, for faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It's telling you there that faith in God comes by hearing the word of God. Communication. By hearing the word of God. Your faith in God comes by hearing. You're being communicated with. Now, as we look at the devil, and he comes into the world, as he came into this world, he did not come with force. He did not bring his band of demons to conquer the world, to take the world over, to in war destroy the earth and conquer it. He did not come with force. He came communicating. Whenever the Lord God was going to save mankind and bring the earth back to what it needed to be, did he send the angels of God, the war forces of heaven? Did he come and take it over by force? No, he didn't. He sent what? He sent his word. It is all based upon communication. That is, that it is your responsibility and my responsibility to what we listen to and what we act upon. Adam and Eve listened to the devil and they were destroyed. Jesus refused to listen to the devil and the devil left him. Which do you want? You want the devil in your house or you want the devil outside your house? You want the devil in you or you want the devil outside of you? 
You got two perfect examples of what happens when you entertain demons and when you rebuke them. But when you rebuke devils, you have to rebuke them by the word of God. We'll see later on some people who tried to cast devils out who themselves had devils in them. And as I've told you, you can't be harmed or hurt by devils. That is the truth as a Christian. The only time you can get hurt by demons is when you play with them. When you play with them and you get in their field, you their money now. And they can do with you whatever they want. But you will have to choose yourself to get in that field. The devil is not going to shove an apple down your throat. Eve, the devil is not going to shove bread down your throat. Jesus, the devil can bring the temptation of bread to me. Yes, he can. But only I can eat it. The devil can bring ever what temptation it is that you're weakest with. He can only present it to you. He cannot make you sniff it. He cannot make you smoke it. He cannot make you drink it. He cannot force you to do anything. This is the reason why, brothers and sisters, that I go to hell. This is the reason that you go to hell. You will not be able to stand before God for the deeds that we have done in our bodies. You will not be able to stand before God and blame it on the devil or anybody else. Why? Because God says the devil had no authority over you. The devil had no power over you. Yes, the devil could bring it to you, but you had to willfully take it yourself. And I gave you the information. I gave you the authority. I gave you the power. And I gave you the knowledge and made it readily available for you to know him to discern him, and I gave you the power to resist. What is it, brothers and sisters? Think about it for just a second. What is it that you can say that you simply did not possess the power to walk off from? Anywhere in your life, the worst thing you have ever done in your life Look at me straight in my face and tell me I didn't have the power to stop it. You did. You had the power to walk off. You had the power to choose not to go in. You had the power to choose not to do it. That's why you are judged, not the devil. The devil is judged for what the devil did. The devil will spend eternity in the lake of fire for what the devil did did he will not go to hell for what you did he will go to hell for what he did you will not go to hell for what the devil did you are going to go to hell if you go for what you did because you are totally responsible meaning very simply and proving again that the devil cannot force anything upon you so the bible also told us an area that we need to be very cautious with Talked about it a little last week. Want to touch on it quickly again this week before I read the scriptures to you. The Bible tells us that the devil did a particular work in Jesus' life attempting to destroy him. Attempting to prevent salvation to the whole world. It's very important that you see how this worked. Because what the devil did then, the devil does now. Same approach in the garden, same approach with Jesus 4,000 years later, same approach today. The devil, so to know your enemy. You see, Jesus was a strong man. Jesus had the gifts of the Holy Ghost in him. Jesus possessed the discerning of spirits. He was able to discern what was in your heart from what was coming out of your mouth. He was able to discern what your true intentions were as opposed to the glitter that you put on the trash. He could see through the initial phase, get down to where the truth was. He could discern this. God has given us access to the same spirit, the discerning of spirits, the same gift. He's given us access to it. Well, Jesus was a master at it. Well, from the beginning, whenever Jesus was encountered by the devil, The devil learned straightway, I can't get anywhere 
with him. He's just not going to listen to me. He's not going to talk to me. He's not going to let me talk. I'm not going to get anywhere with him. Every time I speak to him, he pulls the Bible out on me. He engages in no conversation with me. Every time I talk to him, he rebukes me, sends me away. I cannot bring him to the point of conversation with me. I can't get anywhere with him. So the devil knew. There is no need in me directly going to Jesus because I'm not going to get anywhere. But Jesus didn't want to die on the cross. And I talked about this last week. Jesus did not want to die on the cross. Fact of the business is, he was so afraid of it, the Bible said that blood began to ooze out of the pores of his skin, that he began to sweat great drops of blood. You've been in some binds in your life. You've been in some situations, but you ain't never been there. Amen. Jesus has tasted anxiety and fear to a level that no man on history has ever faced. He did not want to go to the cross. You remember that he went in Gethsemane and he bowed down and he prayed unto the Lord, no doubt crying, sweating blood, said, Father, if there be another way, let this cup pass from before me. He did not want to go. As I brought out last week, what is the easiest thing to talk someone into not doing? Something that they already don't want to do. What is the easiest thing to talk a man or a woman into? Something they already want to do. You think the devil does not know this? Certainly, and we see it worked out with Peter. Is there is an assault upon the emotional man. Do you know you got to be strong to guard your emotions? Do you know where most of you's got hit, where most of you's got hooked, where most of you's got hurt has always been in your emotions? The most likely place to get you is to get you emotionally involved because you go emotionally bland. So the devil knew Jesus don't want to go to the cross. And the devil is saying, I don't want him to go to the cross. Because the devil knew what God had already prophesied, what God had already said. That by the going of that cross, by the way of that cross, the Lord Jesus was going to heal, save the world, and was going to, in fact, take back the kingdom of the world that Satan stole from Adam. The devil didn't want him to go to the cross. Jesus didn't want him to go, didn't want to, go to the cross. The devil and Jesus were in agreement. over at least one thing. Neither one of them wanted to go to that cross. When is it easiest to get somebody to walk with you? When you are in agreement with them. The Bible says, how can two walk together except they be in agreement? Now look, you've got Jesus, the threat to the devil. You've got Jesus, don't want to go to the cross. The devil don't want him to go to the cross. We're in agreement on this. He is fearful of the cross, but he's able to discern my voice instantly. If I speak to him, he is going to know me, know me instantly, and he is going to shut me down. I can't get off jump street with him. Wouldn't that be good if that's what the devil thought and said about you? Wouldn't that be good if that was his opinion of you and me? But the means of approach was not but dead by any means because he could not directly get to Jesus. What if he could indirectly get to Jesus? The best way to get to you, if I can't, is to get to somebody close to you. I can't get to the president, but maybe I know somebody who can get to the president. I can't tell the president what I want to tell the president. So what do you do? You go to the one who can get to the president. Tell him what you want the president to be told. Who wouldn't do that? And the closer, the closer that person is emotionally to the president, the more your chances rise at being successful at getting what you want, though you cannot directly approach him. Now you're having to go through back channels. The person most dangerous in your life 
It's not your enemy that you know, but the friend that's closest to you. That's the one going to do you harm. That's the one can do you harm. That includes your babies. That includes your mamas. It includes your best friends. It includes your children. It includes anything and everything that is close to you. Because you see, anything and everything outside of you has the same responsibility to willfully submit themselves to God as you do. Because it is your baby, because it is your child, because it is somebody close to you, does not mean that vessel has submitted themselves to God. And that vessel then is a tool of which Satan can work through to get to you and the ones in your life that has the greatest pull upon your emotions becomes the ones that become double dangerous. Because emotions blind you. Otherwise, in times of which you could have, would have stood your ground because there is some now, some emotional attachment or some emotional pull, you will now bend in directions that you of yourself would not bend, but you will bend now in that direction because of the emotional connection. So what did Jesus do? Jesus has expressed he didn't want to go to the cross. The devil knows he don't want to go to the cross. The devil knows he can't get to Jesus. So the devil goes to somebody who's extremely close to Jesus and speaks through him to Jesus what he wants Jesus to hear him say. The devil goes to Simon Peter, one of the closest men of God that there was, speaks through him and has him to rebuke Jesus pertaining to Jesus' death. Jesus says he is going to be turned over into the hands of the sons of men. He is going to be put to death. And Simon Peter looked at Jesus and rebuked him and said, Be it far from thee, Lord, that will not happen. Implying we will stop that. When is it easiest to talk someone out of something? When they don't want to do it. Jesus didn't want to do it. The devil now appears to be talking to him through someone who is close to him hoping his voice can be disguised in Simon Peter's voice. But Jesus instantly recognized him coming through the back door and looked at Simon Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. He did not engage in any conversation concerning that matter any more than he engaged any conversation on the mountain of temptation because he knew he was talking to the same person only through another vessel. And the devil got exactly what he got up on that mountain, a straightforward rebuke. You can't talk to the devil, brothers and sisters, and you can't let him talk to you. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, and you hath he quickened, that means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. You was dead. Wherein in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Here the Bible refers to Satan as the prince of the power of the air. That is the means of communication. As I've told you, the word possession, as you and I know it, does not exist in the Bible. It is translated, he was demon-possessed. But remember, the New Testament was written in Greek. And the word that is translated in the Bible as possessed actually means demonized. When it says he was possessed in the Bible, it is saying he was demonized. Now we ask ourselves this question, and it's one that needs to be answered. Can a Christian have a devil? Can a Christian be possessed with a demon? Well, the first mistake that we make is this. Thinking that the word possession as we relate to it is in the Bible. It's not. Whenever I say possession, then you and I would think and feel and assume that we're talking about lock, stock, and barrel own you. Well, no demon in the world can own you. 
There's a man in the Bible who had more than 12,000 demons in him at one time. And yet when Jesus came from afar off, the Bible said he ran to him and worshipped him. So it doesn't make a difference if you've got 20 million demons in you. You are still able to break it. You are. What happens is that the word demonized is what makes the sense of it all. Can a Christian be possessed? Well, certainly I could not be possessed, ruled, and owned by a devil and be a Christian. I can't be a Christian without the Spirit of God in me, without the Holy Ghost in me. So I couldn't have the devil in me possessing me and the Holy Spirit possess. So no, that would be impossible. But it's not even an issue in the Bible, for the word does not exist. The word is demonized. When we say demonized, we're talking about levels of demonization. Are you demonized on the first level, second level, third, tenth, level 1,000? The more you get in you, the worse you're going to be. Every one of us got a devil traipsing around with us somewhere. Are you demonized to the first degree or the 1,000th degree? You will know by the conduct and by the evil manner, the cleanliness or the uncleanliness of your soul and of your heart to what level you're demonized. Can a Christian, a born-again Christian, be demonized? Yes. Simon Peter was a Christian, a faithful, faithful follower. But because Peter found himself engulfed in an emotional situation. His Lord and Savior fixing to be put to death. He found himself in a situation emotionally. He wanted to shut down. He didn't want to deal with it. He lost his footing. And when he did, he became demonized. Not demonized to the thousandth degree, but demonized enough so that he allowed the devil to use him to speak through his mouth, to tempt Jesus not to go to that cross. That was an attack of a demon that come through a man of whom Jesus looked at and said to him, looking at Simon Peter, I rebuke you. He looked at Simon Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. He wasn't talking to Peter. He was talking to the force, the demon. That was in Peter because he became emotionally blind. So, brothers and sisters, clear and simple. You better guard your emotions. And when who you love the most hurts you, that's when you most apt to go berserk and go crazy. Destroy yourself or destroy others. You can not ever stop thinking. You cannot ever lose your mind. You cannot ever lose control of your ability to think your way through. Because at any second, do you know how long it takes to pull the trigger on a gun? Less than a second. As soon as you hear the pow go off, Drop the gun and in a frozen state of trauma, realize what you just did and your heart be truly sorry for it one second. That's all the devil's got to get of you in the right situation to make you make the mistake of your lifetime. For you to become demonized with a gun in your hand. For you to become demonized for just one second. I hope this is getting across to you, the battle, and, and, how, and, and how, how the battle is fought and how you're in control unless you relinquish that control, unless you surrender it. And far too many of us are surrendering our domination every day, losing every day, putting ourselves in hardship every day. Putting ourselves under great emotional stress every day because we just will not man up, stand up, and face this battle with the weapons God gave us. So the Bible tells us that the devil is the prince of the power of the air. What this all comes down to is communication, and we're closing. 
the devil wants to communicate. America was a good place, notwithstanding it had some flaws and faults. Can you tell me a country in the world that don't have some good and bad in it? Don't have some good and bad history in it? This world and the nations of this world is run by human beings. And you ain't never going to get 100% good with that. Never. It don't work. It don't happen. So no matter what it is, if it's in your house, if it's in your city, if it's in your country, if it's in your nation, or if it's in your world, you're going to have some good, you're going to have some bad. You're not going to change America to some kind of socialist utopia and everybody be happy. I promise you, it don't work that way. I'll close with this today. America was once a good nation. You could walk the streets of this nation. I remember in my lifetime that we did not sleep with doors locked. We did not leave and go to town and even shut the front door, just a screen door. That was it. That was it. I remember when you could walk through the parks. I remember when women and children could go to the park after dark with absolutely no fear whatsoever. I remember when a church was never locked. No church, nowhere was ever locked. You'd never lock the doors of a church. Ever. You just didn't. Nobody in the world, even the worst in society, would never dream. I remember riding around drinking beer when I was a teenager. And with the older men that I was with, I always ran with an older crowd for the most part. And I remember riding and drinking beer with them and riding down the road. And I remember th th these old guys, beer joints and beer drinking all the time, would not even raise their beer and drink it when they passed a church on the street. I remember when beer joint men, honky-tonk men, would literally knock your teeth down your throat with no questions asked if you let an F word go in the presence of a woman in the beer joint. I remember that. And something happened to the nation. All of a sudden, God got excluded from it. But how did it happen? What has the devil done? In the 60s, prayers was removed from our schools. What now has your schools become? They then conquered, once God was removed, the educational system. What is the educational system? The educational system is information. The whole of spiritual warfare and the whole of the demonic attack is based upon communication, not force. They have to communicate. You have to hear. You have to respond. That's the eating of the apple. That's the end of your school system. That's the end of your nation. It's the end of your house. It's the end of everything. They took the entire school system over. They took it over at kindergarten. They took it over at grammar school. They took it over at high school. They own the colleges of this country. They own it, lock, stock, and barrel. Why did they focus on the educational system to get it, to rule it, and in the process of doing so, exclude God? Because that is the power that stops them from taking it over. You got to get rid of him first. So they take him out and then they conquer it. So from kindergarten through college, you are pumped constantly, never ending by every professor in every one of these colleges of an anti-God message. And your children that you raised is now turned over to those devils who are what? Informing them with lies that sound like the truth. They then took over the entire media. The liberals own 90% of the media. The school system, the media, information. Who is it that rules and owns Hollywood? The liberals, 
They own Hollywood. They own the school system information. They own the entire media information. They own all of Hollywood. That's your televisions. You know, the people that you wouldn't let come in your front door and stay in your house for three seconds, but because they're in that television and the devil has convinced you, well, all this really is is entertainment. And under entertainment, now you'll let trash come into your house, sit there and talk to your children and to your babies and to yourself for six and seven hours a day that you wouldn't let that same person walk in your house and stay there for three seconds. This war is about information. This war is about communication. So they rule the schools. They remove God. Then they, then, then, then they own the media. And in it, they remove God. Then they own Hollywood. And they remove God. Then they own Nashville. Any means whatsoever of communication, anything that you can watch, anything that you can listen to, anything that you can be uh, entertained with is 99.9% the devil. Thus, the Bible calls him the prince of the power of the air. The power, and I quit, the power, that's the word that you saw in the second branch of demonic spirits last week. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. That means jurisdiction, owned locations. He is the prince of the power of the air power his jurisdiction the world the world is the jurisdiction right now of the devil and will be so until jesus comes back puts his foot down and the bible says claims the earth back for his own so if you will start watching and listening to what is actually being said and actually being done then you will go a long ways in this spiritual warfare.